Welcome to Chips and Salsa, where we talk about security at Intel. I'm Jerry. I'm Krobe. Today we released two advisories, Intel SA00609, which addresses an escalation of privilege vulnerability in the Intel Trace Hub, and Intel SA00598, which addresses two CVEs in certain Intel processors. So in today's show, we're going to discuss the vulnerabilities addressed in Intel SA00598, which are based on research from VU Amsterdam in a paper titled Branch History Injection on the effectiveness of hardware mitigations against cross-privilege Spectre V2 attacks. Say that twice fast. <laughs> it's important to note that uh, while this is interesting research that affects multiple silicon vendors, it is not an attack that would be easy to carry out. And given the research is specific to the Linux kernel, Intel's, recommend, uh, Intel's recommended mit mitigation has already been in place by default in most Linux distributions. Throughout the coordinated vulnerability disclosure process, we have worked extensively with our industry partners, other silicon vendors, the Linux community, and the researchers to implement the mitigation in the Linux kernel starting in version 5.16. This is also already being uh, backported to older versions. Yes. You know, Intel continuously works with and funds academic research of this nature as part of our proactive product security uh, assurance efforts. We also work continuously with our industry partners on security topics and mitigation strategies. So today's disclosure was very well coordinated, anyway, as you inferred, Jerry. And it's this is not the kind of attack we would likely see in the wild. And um, to help the industry understand this issue a little more, understand our mitigations, we brought two really uh, sharp folks from Intel's team, two subject matter experts in, uh, Jason Brandt and Alyssa Milborn, to help explain the issue a little more in depth. I want to welcome our special friends, Jason and Alyssa, here today to talk to us more about the uh, BUA disclosure. Uh, Jason, you want to introduce yourself real quick? I'm Jason Brandt. I'm a CPU instruction set architect for Intel who's worked on a variety of these security issues. Awesome. And Alyssa, you want to say hi and give folks a little introduction? So I'm currently an offensive security researcher for Intel Storm. Uh, I used to cause trouble for Intel outside in academia, and nowadays I'm a troublemaker on the inside. <laughs> we can verify that. <laughs> all right, so um, the VUA research that was disclosed today is all about indirect branch predictions. Uh, can you explain to the audience what that means? So to give a really oversimplified version, which a CPU architect like Jason would be horrified at, <laughs> it's basically about these indirect branches so code has a lot of these kind of jumps, which tell the processor it needs to go start executing code somewhere else. And the thing is, processors want performance. They want to know ahead of time where those jumps are going to go so they can stay ahead of the code and keep executing. And that means they need to kind of guess, they need to predict the targets of these indirect branches. So they can do this because these branches execute a lot and they could look at past behavior and use that to kind of predict what it used this target last time. It's probably going to use the same target next time. But this sometimes gets quite complicated because it is important for performance. If the processor guesses wrong, then it has to kind of take this code that's been temporarily transiently executed, throw away all of the changes that it made, and go back to where it made the incorrect guess. But uh, these incorrect guesses are just performance issues, right? That's what was generally thought until a few years ago when new research was submitted. Uh, and people, attackers had, uh, researcher rather, had figured out how to take this code that transly executed and use it to do something that would have a subtle side effect which would stick around. If they're able to use this transly executed code and they were able to read a secret they wanted and then they were able to put the results of that uh, in something that would that would later leak, something we call an incidental channel or disclosure gadget, then they could leak out this information. So using the side channels, they could kind of slowly, maybe even just one bit at a time, 
try to repeatedly go after and have this transiently execute code uh, leave breadcrumbs that could be later detected. That um, it sounds a lot like a side channel. Um, and I remember a few years ago we had the Spectre attacks. Um, did those involve indirect branch predictions like this new research? So exactly. So in particular, we had Spectre V2 or branch history injection mm -hmm. and the branch target injection. This is a, and basically this was where researchers discovered that we were talking about the processor trying to kind of predict where these indirect branches are going to go. And researchers discovered that Spectre V2 was about allowing them to specify the targets that these branches could go to. And so that meant that they could say that operating system branches, they could tell them to predict to a certain place. And as Jason was discussing, this allowed the attackers or theoretical attackers, because this is all research work, to say, oh, well, I want the target of this branch not to go to the correct operating system code. I want it to go to one of these disclosure gadgets where you might be able to leak memory. So it's all memory that's, of course, accessible to the operating system. But for example, someone running on your computer might be able to convince the operating system to give them memory, which belonged to another process that they shouldn't have access to. Interesting. So uh, how did we mitigate that by just disabling these indirect branch predictions? So on some processors, uh, we were reacting to this in the field when this research was done. And on, on some processors, we were forced to, for example, create modes or create software techniques people could use to disable indirect branch predictions. But that's really not an ideal solution. The branch predictions are kind of an industry-wide technique used to get the performance that people are used to so that your computers can run modern workloads and not uh, the type of small processor you might have like in a watch, uh, in a, in a non-smart watch, um, the old kind. So, uh, so nowadays we've tried to add more enhanced things, uh, more enhanced mitigations, especially one called enhanced IBRS, uh, where it isolates the predicted targets into a certain mode. So the attacker can no longer specify the code they want to execute uh, the predicted targets are only coming from uh, code within that mode, uh, kind of isolating the different modes uh, from each other. Uh, and so the predictions still work. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, you have your application's predictions and your operating system's predictions, and they're just isolated from each other. So the application just can't inject targets with this branch target injection attack. This is what Spectre V2 was into the operating system. And that sounds uh, you know, very similar to uh, the similarity between the two um, attack patterns. You know, what, what's the difference between the target injection and the history injection? Could you explain that briefly, Alyssa? Oh, I mean, they're so closely named that I actually confused them just now. But <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we were discussing the processors really try hard to guess the correct targets. And in fact, one of the tricks they use is to look at kind of the branch history. So these are all of the branches that were taken before this specific indirect branch. And that gives some really useful context that lets you make the right prediction for where that specific indirect branch is going to jump this time. And it turns out that the VUA researchers with this branch history injection, they discovered they can't inject targets, but what they can do is manipulate this branch history, which mm. means that, for example, an application can kind of execute some very specific branch history, and then they can say to the, to the they can make the processor pick a specific target from these operating system potential targets to be predicted for an indirect branch. So it's a, it's a really neat trick. Say so. So if an attacker can run code, can they transiently execute those disclosure gadgets in the OS just like BTI? So they, they can't run exactly what they want anymore. Because remember, enhanced IBRS is still on these parts, and it stops the attacker from injecting targets. So they can't just say, oh, here's some code I want to execute. They, they're limited to kind of, 
the places that the operating system actually branches to, right? Things that they're already there in the operating system mode. And so what they're kind of trying to do is trick one part of the operating system code into accidentally temporary jumping, but something that has to be only a kind of a branch target uh, uh, of another part of the operating system. And so you, they need to find this um, needle in the haystack um, of, of managing to find this one place they can get to jump to this one exact other place in a way that happens to be convenient for them. And it turns out to be a hard limitation. So, um, and that's why I think the researchers initially, they were doing a lot of their work focusing on tools that would let them to specify some of the code uh, in that operating system code, which is something often done by researchers in this area. So they could kind of craft for themselves, here's what I want the operating system code uh, that's jumped to to look to. Here's how I can craft my own disclosure gadget. That's not to say that it's impossible to do that with, with code that's already in the OS, but it's a much tougher uh, task to go and, and find the appropriate places. Um, the VUA researchers did have a working attack described in their paper, correct? Right. So this is kind of what Jason's talking about. The VUA researchers use this technology called unprivileged eBPF on Linux, mm -hmm. which basically met, lets you let potential attackers, but in practice, researchers run kind of code in the kernel that has the exact indirect branches they want and the exact oh. targets they want. So in fact, the original Spectre v2 used this technology, this unprivileged eBPF in Linux, which it's it's literally unprivileged because it's intended for everyone to be able to use, unprivileged users. But it's also been used by a bunch of other attacks in the meantime, especially the speculative execution attacks, where you really want this kind of very or well, fairly specific code in this privileged environment, like your operating system. And it's kind of, yeah, the needle in the haystack is a, is a good example. It's like, maybe it's there somewhere, but it's much easier if you can just make it yourself. Hmm. Yeah, Spectre Variant 4 was another one where the work used unprivileged eBPF. So a lot of these have found it, it okay. just just makes the, the attacks easier when when you can kind of make your victim have the code that, that matches your requirements. So yeah, this is it's very interesting uh, research. Let's talk a little bit now. How, how uh, are we going about mitigating this kind of issue? So, so one of the main mitigations for this is, as Alyssa was was recommending, there's now uh, defaults being created to disable unprivileged eBPF by default, uh, and that uh, raises the bar, making making it difficult for the attackers uh, to go and use this to create the code that meets the requirements they want. Uh, we don't want people to start using the mitigations we've already described, though, right? So enhanced IBRS, other security features like SMAP are still important to keep enabled, uh, even as you do this, because they just uh, they also raise the bar. They've addressed some of the attacks kind of in the past, as well as just just helping in general. Uh, so that is our primary recommendation. And then there's alternative techniques we're also outlining for people that that have other requirements. And it, it's maybe worth saying that at least at the moment, this unprivileged eBPF technology is only on Linux. So for example, it's not there on Windows. And also most Linux distributions actually already disabled unprivileged eBPF due oh. to these known security issues. Yeah, and then uh, <clears throat> we did work uh, you know, across the industry with some of our mitigation partners and with the Linux community to make this the default in the Linux kernel, correct? Exactly. So this was uh, actually disabled by default in the upstream Linux kernel with a patch uh, developed by one of our colleagues working on these mitigations. So this issue sounds very important and a little bit scary. Uh, according to our analysis of the issue, do we think this is actually an attack that could plausibly be used? So it's a really good question. So the researchers have demonstrated it in theory and also in practice with this unprivileged eBPF. And the remaining question and something we've really been trying to look into internally is whether it's possible to exploit this in practice. Mm 
This involves trying to find these disclosure gadgets in operating system code, for example, in the Linux kernel or in Windows, and then trying to work out, can we actually line up all the stars correctly to actually extract some data out of this? Mm -hmm. And we're really actively trying to work on this. I can say I've been giving it hours. It's the kind of thing that our internal researchers, including myself, really love to do. Mm -hmm. So far, we haven't been successful. But if we do find these kind of gadgets, then our white paper has advice for kind of mitigating those specific gadgets. So there's a plan there for what to do if we do find ways to exploit this. And so that's kind of our general approach. Uh, these are not attacks that we're aware of people exploiting in the field. These are not the type of standard attacks that are actually allowing ransomware to infiltrate your system or they're actually causing problems in the field. These do not seem, as far as we know, to be the type of issues that are being exploited right now. But we don't want to just rest on that. We don't want to relax. We want to make sure that we've developed mitigations, we've outlined them, that people can know, uh, can people can do a level of mitigation that should prevent these attacks right now, and then to describe further techniques that can be used ahead of time so that uh, if, if any new techniques are, are, are discovered, uh, the building blocks that people know, the advice people need to know on how to mitigate this has kind of already been shared. We want to thank Alyssa and Jason for joining us here today to share their insights on branch history injection, uh, talking about our collaboration with the ecosystem, and ultimately how Intel worked to mitigate this issue. Uh, thanks, too, to our in industry partners and the research team at VUSEC for their partnership and collaboration in helping fix this vulnerability. Yeah, so for those who want uh, more detailed information about the default mitigation recommendation from Intel, as well as additional uh, hardening and uh, mitigation options available, we have released a tech paper at the link below, and we encourage you to go read that. Yeah, and I, I think with that, Jerry, uh, it's a wrap today on this episode of Chips and Salsa. I want to thank everybody for watching. Yep, thanks. Thanks.